Uh, first off, I've got to tell you about myself before I go anywhere. <laughs> uh, I was born and raised in New Britain. Uh, my parents are Italian immigrants. They were born in the late 1800s, so I'm a change of life baby. My sister was 19 years older than me when I was born, and my brother was 13. My father came to the United States in 1915 when he was 16. He was the youngest of five brothers. His two older brothers were already in New Britain. Two years later, he joined the U.S. Army when they went to war in World War I. So he wasn't even an, uh, a U.S. citizen. Uh, in the mid-50s, my brother entered the Navy, enlisted in the Navy. So uh, when my time came, I was, I was drafted in, uh, let's see, I graduated in June of 1965, registered for the draft in July of 65. Uh, in August, I got a letter to go downtown New Britain. There were two bus loads there. They took us to the induction center down in, um, in New Haven. Excuse me? Just come forward a bit. They told me I've got to hang around the area. <laughs> so we went down to the induction center. You have a physical and all day testing. September, I was going to, I had a full time job at, after, um, at uh, General Electric. Uh, my junior year, during the summer, I got scouted by the University of New Haven. And uh, they, I, I guess I impressed them. They wanted me. Uh, I was going to go out my uh, first year as a walk-on. And they said, the coach told me to find me uh, money afterwards. I got a full-time job at General Electric during the summer. I figured by the end of first semester, I'd have enough there for, you know, to pay my way uh, for the second semester and be able to play ball. In September, I got my draft card. In October, I got my draft notice. Remember, I called up the coach, and he wished me well. Uh, next thing I reported to Fort Dix, New Jersey, in November of, like it said, November 16th. Um, how I enlisted was that two days after I got my draft notice, the Army recruiter called me. And the test you take is called a GT test. It's general technical. It's like an IQ test. It's what you've learned and your potential to learn. So I guess I scored very high. He told me that I can get any school I wanted. Don't let the, you know, don't cast your, your fate to whatever the you know, military is going to pick you, pick for you. So I went down there, and I did not want to go to Vietnam. I'll tell you that right off the bat. Uh, so I looked at engineers, surveyor. I get to Fort Dix. 42,000 soldiers were inducted that month, largest since World War II. We were in in the old section, the, bar the barracks we were in were condemned. Uh, some of the buildings had burned down, so we had a fire watch at night. Uh, the windows were nailed open six inches. This is the dead of winter, November, December, and January. The windows were open, nailed open six inches from the bottom, six inches from the top, because they were worried about meningitis. They wanted to get fresh air in there, even though we froze. After I left basic, I wound up getting orders to go down to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. That's the artillery school. I was kind of confused. I get down there. Uh, we went from drill sergeants that were really nasty to instructors, which were a little bit more human. I convinced them I'm supposed to be at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for, for engineers. He, he, <laughs> my, my instructor brought me into the orderly room, and I got told that, son, you're here now. We've got you. So I became an artillery surveyor. Very small, select group, a lot of math, a lot of math that we went through, and we ran surveys. And their basic job is to lay the artillery guns so you know, for accurate fire. That's what they do. Uh, when I completed my AIT, I wound up getting orders for Fort Lewis, Washington, where the 4th Division was. There were six of us. When we got there, I spent some time, uh, about three months, in an Honest John unit. And it's a... Uh, it's a large rocket, about, uh, about 16, 17 feet long. It's solid fuel. It's free flight. It's nuclear weapon capability. And it's been obsolete. it was an obsolete weapon system. I was told they were never going to go to war, so I was kind of happy. I became a toy soldier. We did a lot of demonstrations for the public, did some training, but we were never going to go to war. And I wound up having my uniforms, my fatigues, and my, my dress uniforms tailored because you're gonna, the public's going to see it. They don't want to see a short guy in all these big baggy uniforms. So I became, a, like I said, a toy soldier. But on July 1st, I got orders to go across, across the way to transfer to another unit. And that was the 2nd Battalion of the 77th Artillery. That's 105 howitzers. They supply close support. Um, 
as soon as I got there, within two weeks, I was in the survey section. They had too many of them, so I went into fire direction control. And that's the brains of the guns. You know, uh, a forward observer would call in for artillery, give them coordinates. Guys would chart it. Calculators would calculate it on a worksheet. And we'd give the, uh, we'd give the guns the, uh, all the information, the direction, the range, the charge, uh, the elevation, so forth. So it's, it's, like, uh, it's like teamwork. So I, I picked that up very, very easily. But the problem was, within two weeks being there, they, we wound up going to the auditorium, and they told us we are going to be deploying to Southeast Asia. At the end of the month, the 1st Brigade went over on a troop ship. Then the 2nd Brigade went in August, and we went in September. There were 4,000 of us. And let me get over here. It's, Let's see. Okay, that was the troop ship I was on. It was the General uh, General Nelson W. Walker. It was built in '44 in Alameda, and it was not a it was not a pleasure cruise. <laughs> we, there were in a room half this size. There were 200 of us. That's how cramped we were. We were at the lowest level. Below us was ballast, which is the fuel. The, the bunks were, they started here, and there's like two of them adjacent, four high. And the ceiling wasn't even, the overhead, they call it, wasn't even that high. Four of you there. And you, you, you slept head to toe. Your rifles were strung in between. Your duffel bags were there. We were like sardines. Um, let's see. Let me, show, let me get another picture up. Let me get another one here. Let's see, the one with the gangplank. There's a gangplank right here. You can see it. Uh, this was taken when we, we loaded, but at the bottom there's a table. I wound up getting, uh, they stopped me before I got on there. They had us bring out our shot cards. And in the Army, you get inoculated for everything under the sun. Well, mine was not up to date. I wound up getting two shots in my right arm and three on my left. I got my duffel bag. I got my M14, all the rest of my gear on there. I couldn't pick it up. One of my couple of, couple of the guys actually literally carried me and my stuff up the, up the gangplank. You know, and then we settled in. Uh, the, like, like I said, the voyage took... 19 days, and um, partway during the voyage, we crossed the international date line. How many guys from the Navy we got here? There you go. I'm a shellback. You know what that is? Yeah. <laughs> the Navy has these interesting little ceremonies, and you cross the international date line, you become a shellback or the equator, right? If you cross the Arctic, you become a blue nose. So my brother was in the Navy in the mid-50s, but he was in the Atlantic. He's still a polywog. He never crossed the international date line. So I got a certificate for it. I went through this ceremony. One of the crew members dresses up like King Neptune. He's got a scepter. He's got guys that help him. He's got a big mop beard and a crown. And you go through garbage and all kinds of other stuff, the ceremony and everything. But it, and, it, and you get a certificate because of it. It's, uh, the Navy, it's a big deal, right? That's a big deal. So let's see. Let me get something else here. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. When we got there, we wound up to a base camp, uh, a camp called Bearcat. It was south of Saigon near Longbin. Uh, the Australian, there was an Australian contingent there. We spent about three weeks there getting acclimated to what they call in-country. And, and then we wound up going northwest of Saigon about uh, 35 miles to a place called Dao Chiang. And Dao Tiang exists because the Michelin rubber plantation. Here are the Michelin tires. That's where they got their raw rubber from. Largest rubber plantation in Southeast Asia, 31,000 acres. It's massive. And, uh, and the Viet Cong had their way in that area. We were in Tainan province, which is, I could say, it's, it's northwest of Saigon. And the end of the Ho Chi Minh Trail was there because part of it sticks into Cambodia. You have two core area, which was the Central Highlands, and one of the guys over there was an I Corps up near the DMZ, and then four core was the D, uh, was the uh, my, uh, the Delta. So the 
the headquarters for, for the Viet Cong in, in, in South Vietnam was in Tainan province, in a place called the Iron Triangle, not far from where my base camp was. So we wound up, I wound up, uh, the first operation I was on was Operation Attleboro. Uh, Tainan, which was northwest of us, the 196 Light Infantry Brigade, came from Attleboro, Mass. So they named, you know, they named them after cities and so forth. Uh, I wound up, well, I was in fire direction control. My section leader was a first lieutenant, a guy by the name of Murphy from Virginia. Uh, I bonded with him as a PFC, uh, stateside. He decided it was too dull in base camp. He wanted to go out with the infantry as a forward reserver. So my section chief told me, guess what? Lieutenant Murphy wants you, wants you with him. And it was one of the things I didn't want to do because the infantry was out there pound in the jungle looking for the enemy. So my first, first patrol I went out, we were uh, about, I think about four or five miles away from Dao Tiang, and we were assigned to the 1st of the 27th Infantry, which was uh, based, uh, they were part of the 25th Division. In fact, Oliver Stone, who made the movie Platoon, uh, was, was there, well, not at that time. He, his, last, his first three months were my last three months. Um, we were assigned to that unit because they were in a large engagement and they left a lot of bodies out there and units from the 196 and so forth, we were gonna be with them. It was the first time I saw casualties, first time I saw dead people, you know. And being uh, a naive young kid, uh, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. Uh, I had never driven a car, didn't have a driver's license when I graduated from high school. Um, I'd never been out of the state of Connecticut. So I didn't have all the life experiences my, you know, guys at my age. So to me, this was like a real culture shock. Here I'm this little guy, really protected most of his life by, you know, family and friends, and there I'm out there seeing the worst. You know, and it shook me up quite a bit. Little did I know that by the time I had, there were like, let's see, it was Operation Attleboro, and then there was Cedar Falls, uh, which was, let me get, I got some notes here. Let's see, Cedar, Cedar Falls. Oh. Let's see, that was from January 8th of January 26th. There was about 16,000 U.S. soldiers from the 1st and 25th Divisions, 173rd Airborne Brigade, and 11th Armored Cavalry joined 14,000 South Vietnamese troops to op mount Operation Cedar Falls. This offensive, the largest in the war so to date, was designed to disrupt insurgent operations near Saigon and had its primary targets in a, in a forest and, and the Iron Triangle, a 60 square mile area of jungle believed to contain the communist base camps and supply dumps. During, and, and uh, it's a U.S. infantryman discovered and destroyed a massive tunnel complex in the Iron Triangle, apparently a headquarters for guerrilla raids and terrorist attacks on Saigon. The operation ended with 711 of the enemy reported killed and 468 captured. Allied losses were 683 killed and 345 wounded. The operation lasted for 18 days. The next one I was on was Operation Gazin. That was February 3rd to February 25th, 21st. And it was a search and destroy operation employed by two brigades of the 25th, which we were under their command. And, um, and the 196 Light Infantry Brigade out of Tainan. Let's see, before the operation, it, uh, it was suspected that elements of the 271st and 272nd VC, Viet Cong regiments uh, were, were in the area. And they're part of the 9th VC Division, which was in Tainan province. And they were the, the 9th VC Division was important because they were the only ones that attacked in mass during daylight. Most of their attacks were at nighttime, what they call terrorist attacks. They never attacked in force, but this group was the most well-trained and most well-equipped. So that was our main objective when, when we landed there. All those operations were after 9th VC Division. Those were some of the elements of it. While I was there, I was, uh, it was during the, during the Tet, the uh, religious holidays, but yet we wound up, we were, close to, we were close to Cambodia. We were within about three miles of the border, our, our fire sport base. In fact, before, before Nixon had him shoot into Cambodia, we shot in there a couple of times without, you know. Uh, and I got to tell you that uh, in fire direction control, there are operations maps. There's like two tables. 
and they have plastic overlays on them. And they're, on, and they're written on grease pencil. You have the basic map itself, and then you have the, a p sheet of plastic over it, and then they write stuff on it. And I learned that in Vietnam was a real, I mean, everybody thought Korea was political. There were, there were villages, friendly villages identified in, in green, unfriendly villages in red, free fire zones, no fire zones. I learned right off the bat, being in the operations center, exactly about the conduct of the war. If somebody was in a no-fire zone, even if it was the enemy, you couldn't fire. It was, to me, it was stupidity. It was just like the, uh, when, when we landed, <laughs> I'm going to backtrack a little bit. When we landed, uh, and we landed by, uh, by troop carrier, uh, like, like you see in the Pacific, and they gave us a box of sea rations and 100 rounds of ammunition, and they told us about the rules of engagement. You see the enemy, you can't fire until they fire first. And I thought this was like the Wild West. They got to draw first? That doesn't make sense. You're at war. You know, so when I looked at that operations map, it used to bug me. If we took fire, when I was with the infantry, if we took fire from a friendly village, we had to call up brigade headquarters. Brigade headquarters called up Viet, Viet, South Vietnamese headquarters to get permission to fire. It's kind of stupid because firefights only last minutes. You could lose a lot of people that way. It was kind of dumb, you know. And then uh, as I got older, after I got out of the Army, I noticed that we were losing people by transfer. In other words, now today they've learned that when you bring a unit over, you bring them back together. You keep the unit integrity so they already operate. They're like a team. What they were doing in Vietnam when I got there after a few months, we were losing people. We'd lose a couple guys from out of this section, a couple guys from this section, but we only got one or two to replace it. By the time it was February, March, most of the units were only at 75% strength. It never got reported because Vietnam was probably the most controversial war, the most misreported, misunderstood war in our history. You know, it makes me upset today that oftentimes that when I see movies and everything, I say, that's a bunch of BS, you know. So I'm, I'm kind of straying a little bit. But uh, the next operation after, I, they pulled me in, in uh, out of Operation Gaston. We were getting some replacements in, and they wanted me to train them. And I multitasked in the unit. Uh, I had a couple different call signs. We had six radios. One of them was mine, assigned to me. I ran a switchboard, I was a calculator, and also I was air advisory. Any time aircraft flew over, whether it was fixed wing or helicopters, I had to, you know, I talked to them, and my call sign was Square Lobster. When I was in base camp, I was Square Lobster Dow Chiang. And I would tell them, I had a clipboard if we were firing at all. I'd tell them what the max word was, the height, the range, and the direction. So that way everyone would shoot them down. My whole tour, nobody, I never had an accident. So I was pretty good at that, you know, not to pat myself on the back. but. I was promoted to, uh, to Spec 4 at that time. The next operation was Junction City, Phase 1. And it was another one of the operations where we went out again. And uh, I was with the infantry this time. I was out for about a week and a half. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't make any contact with anybody. But during the operation, uh, we were running into elements of the 9th VC Division. Finally. I get back to base camp. It's now March 19th, the start of Junction City Phase 2. And let's see. And that was, the start of that was March 19th, and it lasted till April 15th. Uh, Operation Junction City has launched the East Pressure on Saigon. It was an effort to smash the Viet Cong stronghold on Tain, in Tainan province and surrounding areas along the Cambodian border northwest of Saigon. The purpose of the operation was to drive the Viet Cong away from populated areas into the open where superior American firepower could be effectively used. The largest operation of the war to date. Four South Vietnamese and 22 U.S. battalions were involved, more than 25,000 troops the first day's operation was supported by 575 aircraft sorties, a record number for a single day in Vietnam. The operation was marked by one of the largest air mobile assaults in history when 240 troop-carrying helicopters descended on the battlefield. There were 
2,728 enemy casualties by the end of the operation on March 17th. That was the first phase of it. The second phase, and this is where I got involved in the, in the base camp, our, it, we were supposed to go into uh, an LZ called Gold. When, we got, uh, when the first wave of helicopters landed okay, the second wave came in. This is the morning of the 19th, and it was C Company of the 3rd to 22nd Infantry, one of the infantry units in my brigade that we supported. Uh, two helicopters were destroyed by command detonated. Uh, I think 14 guys were killed, and I think about 28 were wounded. I was, I was supposed to be on the airstrip going in with that assault, and they pulled me back to base camp. I don't know why. You know, God must have had a hand in it. But I wound up going to base camp, and we were in a convoy. On that convoy, when we got near a place called Suida, which was where the uh, air assault was going to be launching from. Uh, let's see, we lost two APCs. I think five guys were killed and about another 16 or 19 were wounded. So I spent the night at Suida, and that was an, uh, an Arvin compound. It was also an old sp uh, Special Forces uh, uh, base. The next morning, the morning of the 20th, we airlifted into Fire Support Base Gold. And you could see the remnants of the helicopters, the boom, and the, and the turbine were still smoldering. You know, the infantry, I think they ran a couple of, uh, the Air Force ran a couple of sorties. There were some bomb craters in the southwest corner. Uh, we started digging in. We set up the uh, fire direction control bunker. Let me get that, what the place looks like. There we go. Okay. Uh, what am I doing here? There we go. Now, this is, the, this is the morning of the 21st. I was, let's see, where it says second or seven, the HQ, that's the uh, fire directional bunker. That's A battery, C battery, oh, uh, alpha, let's see, alpha C. Well. There's supposed to be like three batteries, even though it shows four guns there. But you had A battery, B battery, and C battery. And then the perimeter. These are quad 50s. First time we used them in, uh, for, for perimeter defense. You had normal infantry out there building their little foxholes with, you know, with, with sandbags and so forth and overhead cover. Uh, first time they used quad 50s. They, they didn't have any effect on that, on, <laughs> as far as perimeter defense. They got knocked out right away. Uh, I was, the morning of the 21st, I was sleeping about 100 feet away from the bunker up there in the northwest corner. A mortar round came in and woke me up. I was sleeping, there was a large log. I, was, I, had, a, I had my sleeping bag, which was real luxury with the, with the artillery. I couldn't do that with the infantry. Sleeping out in the open, there was a mechanic next to me. We had two generators, one always running because we had six radios and they ran off, off of vehicle batteries. So they had to be constantly charged. I got lifted up in the air. This landed on the other side of the log. These are the mortar fins from 82 millimeter mortar. That's what woke me up the morning of the 21st at 6.30. I remember I grabbed my pants, my boots, my steel pot, and I raced to the bunker about 100 feet away. Ran in there. At one of the reunions, the guys told me they never saw my feet hit the ground. I was running so fast. It's amazing what you can do with the proper incentive. I get in there, and Mortar rounds were like raining on us. They estimated in four hours, they dropped 650 mortar rounds, 400 RPGs, that's rocket-propelled grenades. And I'll show you what they look like. We wound up having a lot of wounded. I think we, we had 60% casualties. We had close to 190. Uh, one of the books I've got has got 187. It's close to it's about, about what it was. Uh, in other words, for every 10 people, six of them either were killed or wounded. So we, had, we only had like one medic, and he was, in, he was in B battery. So I was in the bunker for about 30 minutes. I patched up a few guys that came in. And on your web gear, there's a little thing here, a little pouch. It's got a big bandage in plastic in it. It expands. It's a huge bandage. And there's a little packet of saline solution. That's for if a guy got uh, shocked, you put, put it in a canteen, you make him drink it. But the bandage, you just do quick first aid. 
I patched up a few guys. Next thing you know, we don't, they don't need me in there. Go man one of the guns. So I raced out. First gun I got to, gun number one, the crew was gone. I get to gun number two, that crew was gone. So I looked around and I see a guy crawling way in the northeast corner. He's about 60 yards away from me. He's crawling on the ground. He was the quad 50 gunner. His crew had died. They had knocked that out right, first, right off the bat with an RPG. So I worked my way to him, rolled him over. I could see bones, both his legs and his arm. He was in really bad shape. I dragged him about, about 60 yards. Uh, one of the guys from my unit that bonded with me, uh, Johnny Bolden from Pennsylvania, found a stretcher. And it took us a while to go across to this area down here where they weren't taking a lot of fire. So that was a long ways. That was about 150 yards. Halfway there, the guy kept going in and out of consciousness. And I, I met him in 2015 at a reunion at Fort Carson, Colorado. And I told him, I'm the guy that dragged you to safety. And he looked at me and he said, Bull. And I told him, you smoke Winston's. You're a chain smoker. His eyes went like that. Halfway there, he was trying to get to his shirt pocket for a cigarette. So I don't smoke. I lit one up for him, for him. And my buddy says, what are you doing? I says, he wants to smoke. He says he's dying. So I'm giving him a smoke. Remember when we got off the bus, uh, he called his wife up. He says, you can't believe who I met. There was one guy that was listening to our story. He did a story on us. It made uh, Red Legs Magazine down at Fort Sill and the Infantry Magazine at Fort Benning. Big story about who two guys saw each other almost 50 years later. You know? And uh, he was from... Uh, his name was George Demont. He's from New York State, you know, walking around. He told me he had, he spent 13 months in the hospital. He had seven operations, three in Vietnam, three in Japan, and one in New York State. He said, he said they did like four skin grafts on him. So, so that, w that, was, that was something, you know, to meet somebody like that, that survived, because he was really bad. I remember when I dropped him off in the bomb crater where the, where the uh, chaplain was. I said, this guy's got to go out in the... When we finally get some medevacs coming in, he's got to go out first. My whole time during that battle, I, I made about 12 trips, about three or four of them to the perimeter. One of my trips, uh, I got out there, you know, you know I, I'd crawl over to a guy, see if he still, still had a pulse. And on one trip, the Viet Cong, they were coming in, they did five human wave attacks, a couple hundred at a time. The guns were shooting at low level. Straight down, they bore sighted. They wound up shooting 2,200 rounds of high explosive, and they used something for the first time called beehive. And what it is, it's, you know, if you want to pass this around, this is a fletchette. There's 8,000 of them in the projectile, and they're in reels. And what they do is it goes out, you set the timer on it, it blows up, it's like a giant shotgun. They were exper experimental rounds. I remember I, uh, I talked to the officer, our ammo officer, who got four rounds, four rounds per gun when he, when he drew it. You're only supposed to be like a couple. He got four. Luckily, he did. We shot 40 of these. That was part of things that saved us. There you go. <laughs> it looks like a nail with, with pinched, like it looks like, almost looks like a little arrow, basically. So it's very devastating. But wave after wave, they kept coming in. And it was kind of scary. A couple times, I would pop my head up, and you'd see these guys coming in at you, you know. And I'm, so one, I remember one kid at one of the high schools said, asked me, he says, couldn't you run away? I said, pal, where was I going to run to? They airlifted me in. I couldn't fly, so I had to stay there, you know. So when it was over, I, we didn't get help until three hours. Ammunition was just about spent. Small arms, the guys were just about out. I heard guys crying, literally crying. You know, what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do? So finally we had elements of the 2nd to 22nd and the 2nd to 12th. 2nd to 12th was up there, and they, uh, at a lot of reunions, the guy says, we were three kilometers away. That's almost two miles. They could hear it. They could hear it from two miles away. We got radio. Base camps being attacked, bingo. And they circled. 
because they didn't want to come in because the main force was over here. The 2nd or the 22nd, there was a river, the Sui Samat, that ran this way and that way. The 2nd or the 22nd was M113 armored personnel carriers. It was the dry season, but the embankment, they couldn't, they couldn't, they had to find a crossing. And there were a couple of, uh, there was a troop of armor, 2nd or the 34th armor. About, I think about four or five tanks plus a tank retriever. And when they finally got there, they came in in the south, the southwest corner. I was up toward the north when I saw them come in. And they just, they, they branched out. The fighting went on an hour more. They actually knocked out a tank. That's how devastating it was. So let me show you some of the stuff. Uh, let's see, go back. Uh, that's a quad 50. That's one of the quad 50s. Those are guys from the 2nd or the 12th Infantry. That was out of, out of commission. But there's two machine guns here, two machine guns there. It was a World War II anti-aircraft, but you, wanted, you can still see the ammunition here. Wound up never being used. They got it knocked it out. Next, let's see. Uh, these are the weapons that got captured. You can see. You can see the. There's a lot of automatic weapons, AK-47s. These are RPG rounds right here. These are all the rocket, rocket propelled grenades, grenades themselves, mortars. All kinds of stuff. We captured eight of the enemy. We found out later on their purpose was to destroy the artillery base. They learned in 65 at Idrang Valley in the first cab that no matter how many people you got and how, how many you outnumber, that artillery was going was gonna to level the playing field. So their job was to kill us. Kill. You know, and it's funny. I remember before I went to Vietnam, they gave me this Geneva Conventions card, heavy laminated, in case you become a prisoner. As soon as I got there, I was told, Viet Cong don't take prisoners. You're an enlisted man. You're not worth anything to them. Officers in the North are worth something, you know, flyers. They're worth something. You're not. So if they capture you, forget it. You're going to die. So. Uh. Moving right along. Okay. That's a mass grave. The body count. Okay, the body count at the end of the day was 647 enemy. The, this, is a, this trench was 50 yards long, 10 feet wide. They wound up filling it. They put in about 400 some odd. There were two other mass graves in two other locations where they put in a uh, hundred here and a hundred there, but that was it. These are the ones that are in good shape. I saw bodies that were ripped apart. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me, were these VC or NBA regulars? These, this is Viet Cong. These are, they were part of the 272nd VC Regiment, part of the 9th VC Division. They were very organized. They knew exactly what they were doing. You know, they were well supplied, real well supplied. NVA wore a tan outfit. Yes, Viet Cong were black, you know. Yeah. I think there was a reason for it because they did a lot of their fighting at night. Yeah. So, I mean, there's some APCs in the back bringing them. They would bring in about 20 at a whack. T uh, 10 in the front ramp and about nine in the, yeah, I think it was 11 in one ramp and then nine in the other. It'd be about, about 20 at a time they were throwing them into the trench. We were there for, excuse me, nine more days and the smell was un unbelievable. I was hit the first 30 minutes of the battle. I got hit right here. Bingo. Because there was so much activity with the mortar rounds that my belief was since I'm out here, I'm going to move around. If I stay in one spot, I might get hit by something. So that's why I went after wounded. I made about a dozen trips across the battlefield. Uh, and I wasn't the only guy that, did, that was decorated. We had Six distinguished service crosses right underneath the Medal of Honor. 
about a half a dozen silver stars, about two dozen bronze stars, and about 18 Army commendations with a V for valor. So a lot of guys did a lot of good stuff that day. I served with a lot of brave people, and they were young. I mean, I was barely 20 years of age. I would, in fact, I wasn't shaving yet. I used to get away with not shaving. But when this was over, the battle was so big that uh, later in the afternoon, General Westmoreland was there. He blew off a meeting. He was supposed to be in Guam with President Johnson. He blew him off to come right there. Made a big speech on, the, I remember seeing him on, uh, standing on, on pallets of supplies that were coming in. I mean, it was, it was pretty devastating. 11 out of 18 guns got knocked out of action. Some came back online, but uh, the devastation was unbelievable. There's, there are a lot of articles on it. It did not get the, how can I say it? Like, like the first cab where they had the, the Mel Gibson movie, we were, we were soldiers and young. They faced 2,000. We faced close to 3,000. And we had a smaller unit. In the, in, the, in the book, it says there are 450 of us. We're actually less than 400. So we were outnumbered quite a bit, considering what we did. You know? And it's, it's one of the few times where artillery became infantry. Normally, you're back there, and you're doing close support. This time, we were doing the fighting along with the infantry. And I mean, it was, you know, it was like quite an experience. Uh, let's see. Uh, come on, pal. There we go. I'm out of focus here. I'm, I'm way to the left. There was a church service late in the afternoon. I wanted to get out of, out of radio watch. I had got my leg wrapped up. The guy butterflied it, and they wrapped it up. And I remember sitting there, and you know, I just wanted out of the bunker. So I went to a church service. We had a, a Protestant chaplain there. He was a major. And these are some of the guys you could see. You could see the look on their faces. Suddenly, suddenly you're not young anymore. You know, you become an old man quickly. Uh, Oops. There we go. Uh, let's see. Oh boy. That is me. <laughs> My wife's got a big eight by ten of this that I gave her. You know, it's actually it shows more of me. I've got it here. It's when I first met her in. Uh, in August of 70, she wanted a picture of me, so I gave her, I gave her that, you know. I was 128 pounds, mass of muscles, if you notice it. I was a little guy, I'll tell you, real little. That's, that's a plantation building. Uh, the, let's see. Uh, let's see, that's the executive officer talking to somebody, but the first floor, when you walked in, there was a large room, and then our room was after that. Uh, where fire direct control was. And that's where all the planning was. I was that proverbial fly in a wall. I had this big oversized closet with a table, my switchboard, and a radio. When the battalion commanders come in and plan an operation, there's the operations map. I'm about four feet away from it. I got to know ahead of time what was being planned. The battle I mentioned, it's called Sui Tray. It's on the internet. You'll see it about dozens of places. Uh, it wasn't until 2007, the first reunion I went to, I had a staff officer I met from brigade headquarters. We were staked out as sheep. They wanted, they wanted us attacked. You know, A lot of guys died. I think it was in three days, 59 Americans were killed, 237 were wounded. We paid a big price for, for killing a lot, of, a lot of Viet Cong. So. It was one of those things that made me a little angry. It made a lot of the guys angry. They staked us out as sheep. So it's one of those, you'll never hear about it. They won't make a movie about it. You know. Let's see. Uh, what 
all the pictures you'll see me because I didn't drink. I got a can of Pepsi. <laughs> I, think, I think he's got Pepsi and I got Coke. But these are, let's see, John Bolden, myself, Jimmy Hamlin, S S3, S2 Clerk Intelligence, and C Curtis Barnett from uh, Las Vegas. He was in fire direct control with me. You know, we were, you get fairly close. I knew a lot about what was happening because Hamlin was in intelligence. All the stuff that came down, his cot was opposite me. So I got all the scoop on any intelligence coming in to our unit. So, and he was a blabbermouth, I'll tell you. The wrong guy. Intelligence was a small group. He had an officer, Major Galgano, uh, and two master sergeants. Uh, Andrew Hunter, uh, black guy from Texas, my buddy, and LG Rogers, another master sergeant, and Hamlin, the clerk. You know, uh, that, that is our tent. Actually, it's got, uh, they call it a web talk. It's got a frame on it, there's screening, there's uh, slats there to let the air in and so forth. They put up, there's sandbags that go up so high from the cots. There's eight, eight cots per, uh, per unit. We had a lot of them. Uh, but that, that's basically where we lived in base camp. Our first three months, we had dirt floor. It was during monsoon season. We used to get about a foot and a half of rain in the tent at night. So you couldn't, you, you hung up everything, your shoes, your, you know, your uh, foot locker and so forth because you got flooded out. And then they decided uh, we got to get these tents up, up in the air a little bit. You know, it's like being, it's like having a cottage down at Saybrook. You're going to get water coming in if you're on the, on shore. You know, this is the same thing. That's what I lived in in base camp. I spent out of 300 and, out of a whole year, I spent about 270 plus days out in the field. Uh, my diet, most of the time, was sea rations out there. Ate a lot of sea rations, and I was always hungry. I was always hungry. I grew three inches in Vietnam. I, was, I started out at 5'2", came back, I was like 5'5". Five, five. So, and all the guys used to say we could hear my stomach at nighttime when I was on patrol. <laughs> More than once I had somebody throw a can of sea rations at me when we were, we were dug in. So. Uh, was the growl so loud that the could hear it? Well, put it this way, it's nighttime. You hear bugs and stuff like that. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll get, it, it wasn't all horror, you know. Uh, I had an incident uh, early, in, uh, early going out uh, when I first got there. It was like late November. Uh, Lieutenant says, we're going to go and practice with the infantry an ambush patrol. I said, what do you mean? They're going to show you how you go in, how we set up how we ambush it, and we re-ambush the site. So the following day, I get up, have chow. Tell, you know, Lieutenant said, Lou's coming with me. He says he's not going to be available you know, for radio watch. And, you're, and in Vietnam, we were on 12-hour watches, midnight to noon. Uh, mid, yeah, midnight to noon, noon to midnight, 12 hours a day. Plus, you did stuff afterwards, too. Uh, I was going to go out with the infantry, so I grabbed the radio. The radio is a PRC-25. It's a great waterproof radio. It weighs 23 pounds, plus the battery, an extra battery is four pounds. It's got a tape antenna. It's about four feet. looks like a, you know, Stanley tape. And uh, that, that'll reach out about three miles. Then you have the, uh, the pole, which is read out. That'll reach out to about maybe five miles. But it's line of sight. It's line of sight. So it's FM. It's not AM where it can bounce off of clouds. And the radio was heavy. And the handset was not waterproof. You had a plastic bag over it. And on top of all the rest of the gear that I carried, I carried about, I weighed, like I said, I weighed about 127, 128 pounds. I carried close to 50 on my back. You know, I was like a little mule. You know. Plus I had, when I went with the infantry, we had what they call shared load. Sometimes they would give me a block of C4 in my pack. In my pack, I carried a couple cans of foot powder, can of tooth powder, toothbrush in a case, bar of soap in a case, three pairs of socks, uh, and that was about it. Couldn't carry too much. I didn't shave, so I didn't have to worry about that. Uh, but every now and then, you know, like here, they give me a hundred rounds belt of ammo, carry it around my neck. And one of the first things I learned with infantry that when you go out with them is that they told me bring a bath towel with you. I said why? He says you don't. You're going to use it uh, for a couple of things. One, you know, wipe yourself down when you wash up. Two, when you sleep at night, you wrap your head around it. You know, you use insect repellent, but you wrap your head around it for a simple reason. 
mosquitoes were always swarming. And the other thing was, you go commando. You can wear a t-shirt under your fatigues, but you don't wear bottoms, okay? Reason is, you sweat a lot. I mean, you sweat, sweat. So if you don't, if you wear bottoms, you're gonna wind up getting rashes, you know? I, I did it one time and I got a bad, bad rash. So this ambush patrol, we get, we get up during the day, have chow, we look, go down to the airstrip, load on the helicopters, whole platoon. So there's about, I think about, uh, how many helicopters? About three dozen of them. We land in this one landing zone. We march, I was with a squad. There were like about 12 of us, 12 or 13 of us. We branch off. We're gonna be about three kilometers in. We're gonna be looking for a footbridge. From a, there's a drainage area and a marsh on the far side of this area that we were in. The platoon was gonna be about maybe two kilometers away. That's about you know six tenths of a mile is a kilometer. So what wound up happening, we get there about an hour before sunset. Well, you couldn't dig in, it was all marshy area. So I found a tree, unrolled my poncho, which is rubberized, sat down, put my, took my pack off, my radio, put my, my M14 next to me, you know, I figured, okay, got the radio, got the handset over me, and now it's gonna start getting dark. I, I was about 100, 120 feet away from the footbridge. We were set up in a box formation, so the fire zone was gonna go this way, at an angle. So everybody was like five meters apart. So now it's starting to get dark. There's a sliver moon. I could see the reflection of the water. I had a good field of view of the footbridge. And guys are like, they told us, you gotta take a leak, roll over. Do not walk around, only the enemy is going to be walking around. And it's going to be quiet. About 10.30 at night, I'm starting to doze off. To my far right, I hear somebody, somebody talking. What the hell is that crawling in the brush? Squad leader was to my left. My lieutenant was to my left. Squad leader was a little bit beyond him. All of a sudden he goes, shut the F up. You know. About 10, 15 minutes later, guy closer to me. What the hell is that? Blah, blah, blah. Not a squad leader is really irate. You guys in the morning, you're gonna hear from me, blah, blah, blah. Keep it quiet, you know, and you can hear stuff. So, it's about 15 minutes later, a guy next to me, he's about, uh, about here, that red thing over there. All of a sudden I hear him. I was starting to nod off, and all of a sudden I hear him. He goes, what the hell? All of a sudden my eyes went right, popped open. Five minutes later, I'm lying with my legs out, I'm leaning back, I wanna fall asleep. I figure they don't need my gun. All of a sudden I see this big head. It's a freaking python. He crawls across my leg, his body was like that. He crawled right across. My heart was pumping like a drum. He finally went across my body. He was huge. He disappeared. In the morning, nothing happened. We ambushed the site, marched back, get some chow. I'm standing in line. Most of the guys I don't know except the lieutenant. All of a sudden I hear the guys behind me talking. They're going, Ed, you see that goddamn snake? Excuse me, ladies. <laughs> Man, he was huge. I said, guys, I said, he crawled across me. So one of the guys says, hey, short round. He says, you had nothing to worry about. He says, he's looking for a meal. You're an hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> but I wound up later on reading about pythons. At nighttime, they sleep up in a tree. He was looking for a tree. You know, so I was lucky he didn't, oh yeah, it was, I mean, Vietnam had thousands of poisonous insects, thousands of poisonous snakes. I had confrontation with a cobra, which I got my scrapbook, I got a picture of it. We were in the rubber plantation, uh, we were getting logs, you know, for, uh, for a bunker, and I had the radio and a machine gun. I wasn't one of the beefy guys doing all the bull work, and a couple came up, he's selling Coca-Cola. He had a little trailer selling Coca-Cola. He had to drink it there. And he had a little kid that had a frog. But after the year, about 10 or 15 minutes, they sold a few Cokes, the kid, little kid was pointing to this hole. He's jumping up and down. So my section chief said, go see what he wants. The kid brings me over. I look in the hole, out comes the Cobra. I jump back about 10 feet. You know, I got pictures of him, we shot him. We brought him back and we let the guy skin the head. Later on, there's a lot of scorpions in Vietnam. When we first got there, one of the guys, McCoy, they told us, hang up your footgear. 
hang it up, get it up off the ground. One of these guys, McCoy, one morning, put it on. It was a big scorpion. The bigger ones made you sick for about five or six days. You got a bad fever and so forth. It's the smaller ones, about like that. Those are the dangerous ones. So it was, I gotta say it, it wasn't a fun environment out there. <laughs> when you're sleeping on the ground, I can remember one time uh, rolling up my, uh, my poncho that I slept on with a, what they call a poncho liner. It's a thin blanket, it's a polyester uh, thing that's camouflaged. I rolled it up. There was a snake and a couple of scorpions. They spent the night under me, <laughs> under the poncho. It was, it, was, it was that kind of an environment. You just, you know, it, you know some of the memories I got. I, I'm, I'm cursed with this memory. I remember all this kind of stuff. At the reunions, the guys, you know, guys, one guy wrote a book. He was on my case for a whole, whole year, emailing me and so forth. And guys around the country go, Lou's the guy that remembers everything. I fill in all the blanks and so forth. I'm cursed with that. And some of the stuff is, is bad. I went through, through uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I had 13 months to serve after I got back. I had 32 days leave. I came home. I didn't do too much. Didn't go, you know, here you're home. You're finally away from that horrible place. And I stayed, stayed home all the time. My brother pulled me out. Uh, he worked at the Herald uh, uh, in the composing room. So he knew all the guys up there were like a family. They knew where I was. They had, a, had me chartered all over the place. They got the news. They knew exactly about what was happening to me. And uh, I can remember before I went to Vietnam, my mother never spoke good English. She was here 60 years. Uh, they told her, because my parents are in their late 60s when I went over. There's that much of an age gap. They told her, I was going to go out in the Pacific for about 13, 14 months. So, and I used to write a, a, a form letter to her and my sister who lived upstairs. Uh, how's everybody? I miss your cooking. I got a great tan and so forth. And so, uh, I'll write you again. My brother used to tell him everything. So when they picked me up at the airport, my brother was there with my sister-in-law. My niece and nephew were little. And my parents, because my parents didn't drive. My father didn't drive at night. I can remember sitting in the car. I got all the ribbons on there. My mother's looking at everything and goes, what is that? My father explained to her. He says, remember after we have supper, we turn on Channel 3, Walter Conkright? He said, they show the war. That's where he was at. She must have had a heart attack next to me. <laughs> it, was, it was one of those things. It's, I mean, it's, she didn't know it all the whole time I was gone. So, and we lived, we had a two-family house, but there were tenements all around us in New Britain, all, all multifamily. You know, everybody was a renter. We were the only ones that owned their own house. So there's a lot of neighbors. And at that time, you, you know, you talked with your neighbors all the time, especially at nighttime. That was the big thing, over the fence, talking to them because the houses were close. But she did not know I went. They did a story on me. Uh, one of the reporters did a story on me when I came home and so forth. But it was one of those things. My mother did not know. You know, she did not know. So it was one of those things. So. Could she, could she read English? Oh, my mother could read the paper cover to cover, oh, but she had problem. Speaking. Right. Okay, In other words, wondering. most of my relatives worked in the factories. Yeah. Okay. She never did. Everybody else did. That's how they learned their English. My father was a factory worker. My mother never. He never. He never wanted her to work. He thought it was too dangerous. You know. I mean, all my relatives had bits of fingers missing. You know. My father had a gash on one of his fingers. He was lucky. I used to remember. When the, when the ladies were in the kitchen, they, you know, you, get, you had a lot of visitors in the 50s. They'd come over, a box of goodies from the, the Italian bakery. So I'd go, always go in the kitchen when I was little. And they always used to look at my mother's little delicate hands. I thought, as an adult, when you got older, you got false teeth, you got glasses, and parts of your fingers would fall off. That's what, I was convinced of that. Because <laughs> all the relatives worked in the factories, and it was dangerous. So, but uh, I guess I'm about... I don't know if you got any questions or anything. How long were you? Long my, tour was a year, my tour was a year and a day. I had 13 more months to serve. I served with the 5th Infantry Division. While I was there, uh, I was in another Honest John rocket outfit. And because of my decorations, I was a privileged character. Most of these guys were Cold War veterans, the senior NCOs. I had a private room next to the early room. For, you know, it was semi-private, but I never had a roommate. My first sergeant had
told me when he saw my 201 file, he says, you're from New Britain. He says, I served at the Nike base in New Britain. So he knew where I was from. But I was treated a little differently than most of the guys, that, the new guys that came in. I'm 21 years of age, and I was like their little pet, <laughs> their pet NCO. I, I had a lot of privileges. I played on the basketball team, the battalion basketball team. I made the brigade baseball team. And in July, they had a tryout camp at the University of Denver. He gave me a four-day pass. I got signed by the Pirates. And then he got me a six-week leave. I wound up in the rookie ball up in, uh, in the state of Washington. I played for the Yakima Bears. And rookie ball was about two, two and a half months. I led the league in steals. I hit over 300. Uh, I made money on top of getting paid from the Army. So I had quite a nest egg when I got home. But, uh, and later on I played football on the, on the, on the uh, brigade football team. They needed guys. I was a little, I was a 140 pound running back. <laughs> but I mean, it was, it was a way for me, how can I say it? It was a way for me to escape from what I had seen. You don't realize what it does to you. I once read something, it says, no man goes into combat and comes back normal. When I came home uh, at the end of 68, I was collecting. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I went, you know, I was supposed to go back to college. I just, you know, I wasn't functioning properly. So finally I got a job. I was, I was collecting at the employment center. I was filling out a card every week to get my check. My counselor said, I got a personnel manager from Fafner Bering. Now, Fafner Bering was one of the largest factories in Britain. He said, I got a young man here that's looking for work. So I walked, it's wintertime, I walked, took me about 20 minutes to get there, had an interview, they tested me all, all day long. My father came to pick me up. He was happy. He said, Fafter, he, he retired out of Stanley Works across the street. He said, Fafter pays even better. So I was going to be, uh, I was employed in uh, product engineering, product design apprentice drafter. They're going to pay for my college under the GI Bill. <laughs>